<laughs> um, I was uh, formerly a VP of engineering for a startup called Big Live in uh, Los Angeles. And Francesco had asked me to, to present something here at Erlang Factory because we'd done some work with, uh, with Erlang Solutions that was very successful. And most of what we do there, or all of what we do there, is proprietary. So what I did in order to, to make a presentation was uh, put together a quick sample application that, um, that people can use as a, as a means of introducing new engineers to Erlang. So the objectives here are to provide uh, a sample application that works and is potentially interesting and hopefully actually does something useful. Um, and the objectives of the application are leverage an OSQL backend, show you how that's done in Erlang. It's very easy and everyone should be doing it. Use natively implemented functions. Those are actually also a little bit more complex but relatively easy and when we get into natively implemented functions I'll explain some of the pitfalls and why you want to be careful with that. Um, make sure that people are aware that they can use EDOC and Rebar to sort of um, simplify and automate their, their build processes and provide something that people can use. So the thing that we built, and it took us a couple of days to do it, is actually online at erlocator.org and is on GitHub, the source. Uh, everything is licensed uh, at, at worst with the MIT license. There are a variety of components that are um, Apache, I think some are BSD, but there's nothing in here that is, uh, that is not free for you to use in your own application. And of course, the entirety of the source code is available. All right, so here's the concept of our, uh, of our simple application. We decided that we wanted to be able to quickly and efficiently uh, locate users in close proximity to one another. And the traditional solutions for this take latitude and longitude. Uh, and either perform radius calculations on, uh, on every entry or first take a range of latitude and a range of longitude and then apply radius calculations to that. All of which is fine and works, but the problem is if you have 100,000 users and you try to do that uh, with each data point, you end up with 100,000 indexes and it very promptly becomes a problem. So we decided to solve this problem uh, using, using Redis and, and Erlang. And let's see, I think you can actually see that there. So the way we did it is um, we took the geohash algorithm. And the geohash algorithm uh, is, a, is a pretty simple algorithm that interleaves bits of latitude and longitude and produces a single, a single value. And then it expresses that value uh, in uh, base 32 alphanumeric characters. So we did the same thing, but with a large number instead. And each each one of these things can actually represent a range of an arbitrary size. And you can continually add, uh, add precision by adding more bits on the least significant end of things. So if you, if you create regions like this and you put users in the region, then what you'll have is all the users within the same region, which is fine until your user is down in the corner. And then when you ask for neighbors, you get only the users you know, up in the other side and nobody on on, on the, the edges to which your user is closest. So we just went with a three by three grid. Very, very simple. Uh, and we exposed it you know, with a web API. But one last note, this is just a sample app. There is no security on it at all. It's wide open. If you deploy it, deploy it carefully behind firewalls. <laughs> and when I get into the web API, you'll see why that is. Okay, so we'll take a look at the, uh, at the front end. To build the front end, um, we didn't want to spend any time on, uh, on design or graphics, uh, so we just grabbed Twitter Bootstrap, which is free and, and easy, and it, it works. It gives you something that looks good, is presentable, has a professional appearance, costs you nothing, and is done in minutes. Um, we rolled into that the Google Maps API, because that's how people you know, like to see things geographically. Again, this is all based on latitude and longitude. You could put it anywhere you want, and this is all just JavaScript on the front end. So. I mean, it, it doesn't, it's not necessarily tightly integrated. Um, and then to uh, provide some uh, identity information, we use the Facebook JavaScript API so that you can actually be yourself and see who you are and who your neighbors are on the map. And I've got the, 
got the URL there. If, I don't know how well the Wi-Fi is working, but if you guys have laptops and want to log in, you can actually play with it. It's at erlocator.org. And at the end of the speech, I'll try and actually demonstrate it, but my Wi-Fi hasn't been the best, so we'll see how that goes. Okay, so I didn't spend much time on the front end because the audience isn't all that interested in front end stuff. Um, so let's get to the, uh, to the back end. Um, it's a very simple Erlang application. Uh, the core technology uh, is really the way that latitude and longitude are, uh, are arranged. It's very similar to GeoHash, except we use numeric, uh, numeric values. To build the back end, we built and, and are giving away under the MIT license um, the GeoNum in an if. Um, we used Redis, just the standard, um, in this case Debian, Redis, no particular requirements. Um, MoshiWeb, which is a, a tool for building uh, HTTP servers in Erlang, quick and easy, gets the job done. We used eDoc to generate some documentation for the code, and I'll talk a little bit more about why a mundane detail like that is important, uh, and a rebar to, to wrap it all up and build it. And down at the bottom, you've got the uh, GitHub um, identifiers for both. All right, so some more detail on, um, on how the, the data is actually stored. If you take a look at, at that number, I've got latitude and longitude, which are somewhere in San Francisco. Um, and when you, when you make the request, it produces a, the geonum of 437.21694. And that is represented down below. The most significant bit is a flag. It's a placeholder, so that if you have a lot of zeros, you don't end up with a problem. And then we just interleave longitude and latitude bits back and forth um, it, until you reach the desired precision. And the idea here is that you will use relatively less precision in order to have a region so that there's a number, there are a number of users stored uh, within that region. Uh, the implementation of, um, of GeoNome is, is, is a, a natively implemented function. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, natively implemented functions are small routines in C that you can actually pull into your Erlang code to improve execution times of computationally intensive tasks. The, the risk with, with a NIF currently, and there, there, there are uh, improvements in the language coming up that will hopefully, uh, hopefully improve the situation, but the risk that you have right now is that the C code is a black box. You don't get the preemptive multitasking. Uh, the, the, the Erlang virtual machine doesn't have nearly as much control over it. So you want to make sure that these things are short and they, that they execute very quickly and that you don't build too much into the NIF, because if you do, then you lose a lot of the value that you have uh, with the Erlang VM. But to use a NIF, it's very simple. Um, in your, uh, on, the, on the module load in the init, you just load up the, um, load up the shared object. And then in the, uh, in the code, you wrap it and call it. And the Erlang is very simple. You can see an example at the bottom of the slide. And just for fun, I put the documentation down in the, uh, in the lower right, in case you need any reference. The C, also relatively easy. Um, there's a header that you call and wrappers that you use. You can see examples here. And essentially, what the wrappers do is um, pass the arguments in, execute the C, and format the results in such a fashion that Erlang can handle them. Very, very easy. All right, so Redis. I, I expect that everyone here is reasonably familiar with Redis, but uh, if not, I'll give you a quick introduction. Uh, it's actually the remote dictionary service. It stores and serves foundational structures. Those are lists, ordered sets, and key value. Very, very simple, simple stuff. But it's fast. It's all in memory. You are limited to um, the set of data that you can hold in RAM. If you go beyond that, you'll find that things don't work very well. Uh, and I've included a variety of URLs here. It's licensed BSD, no problem. Um, obviously, the optimal use case for something like this is data that's tiny so that you can have a lot of it so that your scaling doesn't become an issue. Um, you know, and, and on a machine that has enough physical RAM to, to make it workable. Frequent reads and writes because it's all in memory, it's very efficient. And uh, transient. 
there, there, there are some persistence capabilities in Redis, but um, for my optimal use case, I avoid them. Uh, let's see, so the way we're using Redis in this case, we have three specific keys, and they're, they're very obviously named. We've got geonum with a colon and then the numeric hash number. That's actually a set of the user IDs that are within that particular geographic location. You've got a geonum underscore user colon followed by the Facebook ID, and that's the data for any user. And we allow you to put, you know, essentially arbitrary data in that you pass in in parameters, but that just gets stored um, so that you can, uh, you can include not just the user, but also some interesting information. You can have um, profile links and so on and so forth. And then you have uh, an expires table, which is a sorted set ordered by when the thing expires, and we essentially just launch a, a background process that runs through and uh, deletes things that need to be deleted. Uh, for this implementation, we use Redo. Redo is a very simple uh, pipelined uh, Redis client implementation for Erlang. It has one and one API function only. That's Redo command and or Redo command, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And you just pass the Redis command into it. Very simple. Um, for the web API, we use MoshiWeb. MoshiWeb is an extraordinarily simple um, set of tools for building lightweight HTTP servers. I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with it, I would hope. But uh, you essentially run through a loop. Uh, there's there's a, a case statement inside the loop that uh, switches based on the method that's being called. Uh, you've got, we implemented post and, or head and get together and then post separately and then inside each of that you just call the code you're gonna call for the particular URL in question. Rebar. Rebar is really easy and should always be used. <laughs> I don't know how to say this simply enough. Um, the only thing you really have to do with rebar is is get it. Um, we pull it directly off of GitHub and put it into the into the into the project. It's a it's an Erlang script that just executes. It's very easy. Um, there's an example of a make file there. The only thing this is this is a pretty standard make file. The only thing that's uh, that's at all different about it is that it calls document as well as as the other, you know, as well as compile and get depths. And then on the configuration at the bottom, you can see that we've configured it to uh, to go and get um, you know a dependency. Very easy, very straightforward. Um, you know, any experienced software engineer shouldn't have any trouble picking it up. Edoc. Edoc is easy and everyone should be using it. And this is, this kind of gets into why, um, why I'm doing this. If you take edoc and you put headers on all your files and you document every one of your functions and you use, um, and you use rebar doc to generate your documentation, you can actually hand the source code with the documentation to any new engineer who's not familiar with Erlang and they can kind of figure out what's going on. Um, in a lot of cases that doesn't get done and it becomes really daunting and difficult. But, I mean, it, and I've got an example of, uh, you know, just a header file and a function description. Uh, so, uh, the last is a, an explanation of the API that we exposed. We're getting geo neighbors. You pass in a geo num, and it returns the, all the neighbors in a three by three grid. Very simple, there's a, there's a bounding box uh, target that will show you what the region is. Uh, and then for the post, there's a set and a delete. And then the last two are sort of the reason that you would never expose this publicly. You've got a generate, which will create randomly um, neighbor entries, just you know for testing purposes. And of course, you'd never want that in production. Uh, and then there's flush all, which clears all, the, uh, clears all the keys in Redis. And you would also never want that <laughs> in production. <laughs> uh, so let's see. I'm going to see if I can actually, wow, this is huge. Um, yikes. <laughs> I'm gonna have to make this much smaller. Let's see what we can do here. Oh, it is actually working. So. The green thing at the top.
Can you bar an XEAX? That's what he said. Okay, there we go. Oh, yeah, full screen. That'll work. Uh, okay, so this is me. This is, this is what it is at the default. Obviously, I haven't told it who I am. So let's see if that works. There we go. So it got me. Um, Yeah, I can't even see the rest of this thing. That's annoying. Uh, so, if I so a couple of people logged in. And these will actually all just disappear within about a half an hour. But yeah, it logged me in several times. Neil's in. Huh, I have two entries. That's a bug. But anyway, there you have it. Um, if, you, if, you, if you can see it on a, on a larger screen and scroll down further, there's uh, you know, the ability to um, create neighbors and do that sort of thing. But can you log in now, though? Can you try it? Yeah, you should be able to. Yeah, it's up. So it is, in effect, the simplest thing on the planet, and I think everyone should have done it years ago. So when I do it on the demo, it takes me to uh, Philadelphia right now. Yeah, that's the default. Or just reload the page, either one. Yeah, if it doesn't, if it doesn't initially report the location, that's a default. Yeah. But yeah, I mean it's. Yeah, generate a hundred of them. We actually threw ten thousand at it when we were just getting started to see how it worked, and it worked fine. The client was a bottleneck. It, uh, the data actually came back in about two seconds, and then the client choked trying to put all that on the map, <laughs> as one might expect. But does everyone see how extraordinarily simple this is? You think you could hand it to uh, someone who doesn't know Erlang and bring them up to speed? Okay. Right on. Well, I mean, the the objective here is to to have a sort of reference uh, a reference application that you know that people can look at. And if you guys want to take a look at it and uh, make contributions, by all means, that's encouraged. Um, but it it shouldn't be it shouldn't be difficult. It shouldn't be scary. It should be fun and easy. Are there any questions? I'm noticing the programming in the background is people that you give this to as a reference set. Is there some functional programming for, or what's the, come from an imperative background? Or Generally, an imperative background, probably um, object oriented, probably um, JavaScript, PHP, HTML, just, just very typical web stuff. And what we want to do is we want to bring those people kind of into the fold so that they can do more of the back end work as well. Well, yeah. So essentially, you've got you've got two number spaces with latitude and longitude. You've got you know negative one eighty to one eighty and negative ninety to ninety. And uh, what we do is we just add it so that it begins at zero and goes all the way up, and then divide it in half, divide it in half, divide it in half, divide it in half. So you should have you know you should have any of your neighbors. We've we've essentially eliminated the the negative number problem or the one negative one problem. I'd have to look at I'd have to look at the edge cases, okay. um, but I'm I'm not I'm not immediately aware of um, areas where it wouldn't work. Okay. But yeah, I mean if if you um, 
If you want to follow up, let's let's do it. Okay. By all means. Any other questions? All good. All right, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. No, we're getting those from the uh, from the browser, and you can actually drag and drop the icon if you want to move it. So if for some reason it thinks that your IP is a million miles away, you can just you can just drag your pin on uh, on the Google Maps API and drop it, and it'll reset you. What's the IP? Oh, I don't know. I mean, well, it's going to be in, in this case, it's by IP. So some IPs are very accurate, others are poor. Um, and and it, it's, it's controlled by your provider. And the providers do, they, they exhibit varying levels of effort <laughs> in this area. So, I mean, there, there are some cases where in parts of the Midwest, I'll show up in Chicago, right? <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> that's just the way it is. But that's, that's why we allowed you to, to drag it and put it somewhere else. I mean, the, the, the system itself runs on latitude and longitude. If you have you know, if you have a better way of specifying that, then you're gonna, you, you'll get better results, right? Like mobile is yeah, mobile is much better. Yeah. Well, mobile actually runs on GPS. Yes. Uh, so you wrote that you only own like one of those mm -hmm. like, Were there any other libraries that were kind of the same thing? Well, the GeoHash is very similar. Okay. GeoHash is very similar. There's also, uh, there's also a Haber sign that is different, but, you know, potentially comparable. I mean, yeah, this is, I wouldn't, I wouldn't lay claim to the, the original algorithm. That's, I mean, it's more or less the same as GeoHash. The, um, you know, we just expressed it as an integer, simply because computers are better at numbers. I mean, going this way, you could, if you wanted to, for example, uh, create a, a Z set scored by, uh, scored by number and actually have, uh, you know, do bitwise masking and, and ranges of things like that. I mean, it, it's, it's a lot easier than than working with the text. Any other questions?